Okay, I think we'll start now, if that's okay. Hello and welcome to the first in the new series of HK45's Fireside Chats with influential practitioners from the international arbitration community. My name is Ben Berry and I'm one of the co-chairs of the HK45 alongside Joanne Lau and Eric Ng. I'm absolutely delighted today to introduce uh, our guest, the Right Honourable the Lord Leonard Hoffman. Now, I think the phrase he or she needs no introduction is overly used, but Lord Hoffman is one of those rare individuals who we can truly say needs no introduction. Uh, born in South Africa, Lord Hoffman won a scholarship to Oxford University where he studied the Bachelor of Civil Laws. After an impressive career at the bar, he was appointed to the High Court of Justice Chancery Division in 1985 and was knighted upon his appointment. He was appointed Lord Justice of Appeal in 1992, and as a Lord, or Lord of Appeal in Ordinary, um, what we would uh, commonly uh, call a Law Lord, in the House of Lords in 1995. Lord Hoffman has delivered judgment in some of the most well-known cases in English legal history. This includes his seminal judgment in Investors' Compensation Scheme and West Bromwich Building Society, which is one of the most frequently cited precedents for the interpretation of contracts. We may also recall William Sindor and Cambridgeshire County Council on misrepresentation, Cooperative Insurance Society in Argyle stores on specific performance, the Achilles on remoteness of damage, and Bruton and London and Quadrant Housing Trusts on leases and licenses. Lord Hoffman has a long history with Hong Kong. He's been a non-permanent judge of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal since 1998. In 2014, he was awarded the Gold Bohinia Star by the Chief Executive of Hong Kong. Lord Hoffman has left his impression on the Hong Kong legal landscape. In particular, he, lived, he delivered judgment in Jumbo King and Faithful Properties, which is the leading Hong Kong case on interpretation of contracts. He also delivered judgment on Kowloon Development Finance and Pendix Industries, in which the Hong Kong court adopted Lord Hoffman's own beta comments on the law of rectification of contract for common mistake in Sharkbrook and Persimmon. This decision is of particular note given the decision of the English Court of Appeal uh, a few years later where they decided to take a different approach. Lord Hoffman delivered the leading judgment in several other C CFA decisions including Peconic Industrial Development and Lao Kui Kwok Phi, which established that a director of a company is a trustee in relation to its asset. We may also recall Secretary for Justice versus Jerry Liu Kin Hong on the admissibility of documentary evidence in a criminal trial, and Lee Defan and the Hong Kong uh, Special Administrative Region on the legitimate use of an appellate's failure to give evidence. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I am very pleased to only be introducing Lord Hoffman before passing the baton to Prideri Diepschlag of Clyde & Co to ask the questions. As an overconfident 20-year-old student, I attended a lecture by Lord Hoffman and dared to ask him a loaded question about his, his interpretation of leases in his judgment in Bruton and London and Quadrant Housing Trust. I can't recall the question now, but Lord Hoffman's sharp response cut me down so quietly and completely. I was left wishing I had never asked him anything and hoping I would never have to do so again. So with much excitement and a little trepidation, I pass now to Braderi with a final thank you to you, Lord Hoffman, for giving up your extremely valuable time to speak with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That's a, a helpful introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, as Ben mentioned, my name is Pradari Deepshlag. I'm a committee member on uh, HK45, and I have the enormous privilege to be speaking with Lord Hoffman today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, now, as viewers of the previous series of these fireside chats will remember, um, the aim today is to discuss where you, uh, your journey to where you are today, what you learned along the way and hope to provide some sort of inspiration for young practitioners. Um, and that gives me the great fortune to not be asking you pointed questions of law 
um, as Ben did when he was a youngster. Um, so I suppose uh, we should start then um, where you started. Um, and I'm, I'm remiss that I ought to have wished you a happy birthday, a belated happy birthday, but um, A few days ago, yes. Yeah. Uh, so you grew up in South Africa um, at a time when it was a, a very different place from what well, it was. Yes. I grew up under apartheid, yes. Mm. Um, and the Second World War, of course, as well. And the Second World War, yes, particularly in Cape Town, which was uh, probably more in touch with the Second War than most places because of all the troop ships coming through. And do you feel as though that part of your life, which we often call the sort of the formative years, did that influence your character and your principles going, for going forward? No, not that I'm aware of. It was just uh, made the city more interesting, perhaps, than it might otherwise have been. Fair. Um, and then thinking back to your, your family life um, when you were a youngster, I understand your father was a solicitor as well, one of the, the founders of quite a prominent firm in, in South Africa. Yes, my, my father was a solicitor in Cape Town and um, in 1936, uh, he, he and another Cape Town solicitor founded uh, what after a number of amalgamations and changes of name and so forth is, is now the largest firm in Africa, ENS Africa. Hmm. Did you feel, was there familial pressure then for you to follow in his footsteps? No, I mean, pressure suggests that uh, it's something against which one reacts or might react. Uh, I think it was just uh, assumed in the family that I would become a lawyer and it went along. I went along with it. I didn't have any problems about it. Was there then one particular aspect that, that attracted you to the law right at the outset? I, I think it... it no, it's, it's hard to say, I think, because uh, you, if you say attracted me to the law you're talking about when I was a schoolboy and so forth, and I used to go and occasionally and get, be taken into my father's office and see the rows of law reports behind, behind glass on the shelves. Um, but uh, no, I can't remember that I knew enough about the law to be attracted by it, if you see what I mean. That's interesting. So then how... Could you talk me through the thought process then that led you to study? I, I, I assume you read law at uh, the University of Cape Town. No, I did not. No, uh, 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 the, um, <clears throat> the law degree in Cape Town, like in the United States, was a postgraduate degree. You, you first did a liberal arts uh, degree uh, and that was all I did there. And it was almost entirely economics. Hmm. That, I mean, that, was what, that was what I was interested in at the time. Uh, in fact, I think the, the, first, the first, um, first thing I can describe as an intellectual experience in, in my life was r reading uh, Keynes's general theory uh, in 1952. Well, at that stage, Keynes's general theory was only 16 years old. Uh, it had been written in 1936, and the various policies which it uh, proposed had really been overtaken by the law, by the war, when they had been given effect in spades, in the sense that there was an enormous amount of government expenditure which kept up employment. Uh, and so, uh, what I found reading Keynes's general theory was that uh, what I had been taught before, even just the year before, of classical economics was entirely wrong. <laughs> and for me, that having been at school and being taught various things there and then at university and being taught in my first year, to discover that something that you'd been taught could be completely wrong was a really formative intellectual experience. And, and potentially served you quite well uh, on the bench. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, so then I suppose you, you turned to law then when you um, moved to Oxford. Came to, came yeah. to Oxford, yes. Um, so then at that point, 
you, you'd studied law at Oxford, but then you didn't continue it in, in the UK. You, you moved back to South Africa. Um, yes, we, we, we moved back to South Africa, but we, when we did, this, uh, I mean, when I uh, left uh, Cape Town, I left behind uh, a, an 18-year-old girlfriend uh, whom I'd uh, met at a cricket match a couple of years before that. So she was then still at school, 16. Uh, she's now my 86-year-old wife. Um, and uh, we, she came afterwards to, uh, to England while I was still there as a student. And when we returned to South Africa, it was to have a family wedding. And we were quite certain that we were, this was going to be a temporary stay. We were going to return to England as soon as that could be properly, properly arranged and uh, have something to do there and so on. Um, and there was a little slippage because we had a baby. Uh, but we then returned to England as planned, or more or less as planned, in early 1960. Hmm. Okay, and then and then the the Republic was declared the following year, I think. Yes, the Republic was declared after we left. Yes. Yes, interesting. Okay, um, and so then you came back to the UK to take up a teaching position. So. Well, no, I came back to the UK. Um, all I had when I and my wife and the baby came back to England was um, the offer of a job as um, uh, what one might call an unarticled clerk and general dog's body with a firm of solicitors uh, in Fleet Street. Uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the senior partner was a Mr. Goodman, afterwards Lord Goodman. And uh, I worked there for, for a year. Um, I didn't enjoy it very much. I, it, it, I, I didn't like having clients and I altogether it didn't seem to suit me. Uh, so um, after about five or six months, I was uh, rung up by uh, a, a law fellow at University College Oxford who said, my, my colleague is retiring uh, and we're going to be looking for someone. Would you care to apply for the job? So I did and, and I got the job. And so I suppose you, you didn't finish your articles at that point if, if you... I had no articles. I never took it, never entered into any articles. I would just say an, an article, an unarticled clerk. An unarticled clerk, <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so then you, you talked for a, um, for a great deal of time, but slowly transitioned, after a couple of years, you transitioned to the bar. Right. Yes. Um, uh, we had a, uh, it was quite common at Oxford Colleges for former members of the college who were at the bar to help with the teaching. They would come at weekends and do, do some uh, teaching. And uh, there was a uh, member of Lincoln's Inn, Paul Baker, who was um, deputy editor of the Law Quarterly Review and had uh, edited a number of legal textbooks. Uh, he used to come to us for weekends and about, I think it must have been about 1964 or so, um, I had a, a, year, a, a term sabbatical leave available. I'd been there for four years by then. And uh, walking around Christchurch Meadow with Paul Baker, I said, I've got this term sabbatical leave and I'd quite like to spend it uh, doing a pupillage at the bar. Uh, would you be my pupil master? Uh, and he said, no, but I'll, I'll, find, I'll find somebody else who will. <clears throat> so <coughs> he then found another member of his chambers, Jeremiah Harmon, who afterwards became a judge. And uh, he took me on as a pupil. And I, I enjoyed that very much. And so uh, at the end of my pupilage, I uh, was taken on as a member of chambers. But I then, for about four or five years combined that with continuing to teach uh, at University College uh, until in the end I decided I wasn't doing either job very well and I had to choose one way or the other. Did you have a, 
a career plan at that time? I, it, it sounds as though you didn't, and, and it took four or five years for you to sort of crystallize as to which way you wanted to jump eventually. I suppose so, although, yes, I, I, I think the answer is yes. It did take some time for me to think which way I ought to go. Hmm. And the problem, the problem with being an academic is I very much enjoyed teaching undergraduates. Uh, but as the, the age gap widened between me and the undergraduates, it, that sort of aspect of the matter became slightly, slightly less uh, uh, rewarding. And I didn't have any great academic project underway. Uh, so, uh, you know, I wasn't writing a book on anything in particular. Or I, I did write a book on South African law of evidence, actually, at the time. But then that was finished, and, and so I had nothing else that I was doing. And uh, going to the bar, I thought, well, that will give me a better reason for getting up in the morning. If, uh, you know, if you know that you're in court on Tuesday, you've got to prepare the stuff, and you've got to be there. Mm. So really, there, there's a sort of a, a drive there because the, the client requires you, and, and there's diary entries. And sorry. So, was the drive there? Was the motivation? derived from the client's need or was it the intellectual challenge and the court deadlines? Yes, it was the it was the it was the intellectual challenge and the court deadlines, yes. Yes. <laughs> it was it was more I don't know, it it, it was it was real life in a way in which uh, uh, simply uh, having undergraduates to a room for their tutorials each week was not. Hmm. And and is that still what motivates you today winding forward a, a couple of years um is that still what motivates you today the intellectual challenge yes certainly yes that, i mean that's what it's all about isn't it hmm. well from it, it could be argued that the many young lawyers go into the profession with a righteous goal of, of helping Helping well, they're, 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 they're different forms of different kinds of lawyers. I mean, there, there are admirable and eminent lawyers who know virtually nothing about the law, but they are extremely good at advocates of persuading juries of all that sort of thing. Uh, I, I just happen to be interested in, in the law. Hmm. And uh, I think that that shows in whatever I've done. I, I agree. Um, and then at, at that time, well, we hear a lot now about the importance of mentorship. Would you say there was somebody other than your pupil master, because that's quite a, a short period of time, was there somebody who took you under their wing or was there somebody who you aspired to, to emulate? No, I've never thought of myself as being under anybody's wing. I mean, I learned, uh, I learned a lot from my pupil master, Jerry Harmon. Uh, both uh, as to how to do cases and also, I'm afraid, how not to do them. Uh, but uh, um, I can't think of anybody um, whom I uh, was sort of given lessons by or taught by or anything like that. Hmm. I know, I mean, to even going back to school, I had a terrible education. I mean, I, I, never, I don't recall at school in South Africa any teacher ever suggesting to me that I read a book. Or, you know, which wasn't sort of a set book on the syllabus, or look at a picture, or listen to a piece of music, or anything like that. Golly. Do, do you think came, you would have... I came to England totally uncultured. <laughs> do you think you would have benefited from that sort of men mentorship? Or, I mean, it no. clearly hasn't held you back long term. I, I can't tell. I can't tell. Maybe I would. Yes, maybe I would. I'd, I'd, I'd like to believe it, otherwise the, the yes. work that I do is, is pointless. Yes. Well, different, <laughs> people have, different people have different needs, you know. It's, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And so then, winding forward again to 1985, you, you moved to the bench. Sorry? After, so then, moving forward to 1985, you moved to the bench. 1985, I was appointed judge, yes. 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 Um, and now when you look back on it, recognizing that your motivation was the intellectual challenge, 
do you see a, a difference in your enjoyment? Did, did you prefer arguing on your feet or did you prefer determining the position? Well, it, it, um, it didn't, uh, it, it held few surprises in the work which I had to do. It was a bit odd at first. I mean, you know, you, you, you sit there on the bench and you have your former colleagues and friends as advocates appear before you and they argue the case and one of them wins and the other loses and the one who's won goes out with his clients to the Savoy for uh, lunch and champagne and so forth and you go back to your room on your own and your clerk gives you a cup of tea uh, and, and uh, it, it, from a social point of view it becomes a very different sort of life. Uh, but intellectually, it is interesting because you don't have to persuade some other boring old so and so to have to decide how to decide the case. You can decide it yourself. Um, the only the only audience that you are looking to is the man who lost. Obviously, you've got to try and explain to him as best you can why he lost, and the court of appeal, whom you've got to explain to why you think you were right. And then, forgive my ignorance, but is is there not also an element of trying to convince your, your peers on the bench. Well, yes, exactly. But that would, that's the Court of Appeal, yes. True. Sorry, correct. Uh, stepping yeah. up to the, the Court of Appeal, yes. Um, so then, if you look back again, um, doing some research for this, for this conversation, I discovered that you are listed as the judge in some uh, 1,100 cases. <laughs> over your over your years i wonder if any of them still particularly stand out to you any well, stick out cases that i was involved in while on the bench mm. yes yes I, I mean i think i enjoyed those cases in which i felt that i was disentangling uh, what had previously been a muddle at least to my own from my own point of view, I thought I was doing some dissent. Not everybody would agree. Uh, uh, Jonathan Sumption and I have got a running controversy about how you interpret contracts and how you imply terms and so forth. Uh, but to, to my own mind, I felt I'd disentangled some muddles. Uh, and to that extent, uh, the cases I enjoyed were, for example, uh, a case called Meridian, which was an appeal from New Zealand. Uh, about uh, what what counts as an act of a company, whose whose action should be attributed to the company, and why? Uh, and I I thought that 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 sorted out what had previously been, and that I think was on the whole being successful. I don't think anybody's uh, uh, questioned uh, that particular analysis. Um, obviously, the the things less so. The uh, uh, the um, uh, um, interpretation cases le less successfully. Um, uh, I there was a, uh, what I thought was in retrospect a particularly unsuccessful case was a case about implied terms called um, uh, Belize Belize uh, uh, Telecom I think it was in which I said that. Uh, uh, a term is implied because that is what people would reasonably understand the contract to mean. And that's true as far as it goes, but it's a useless thing to say because you first got to explain in what circumstances they would reasonably understand it to mean that. And that I didn't do. So that was a failure. But uh, uh, so you know, some, some have been successful, but that's the kind of thing that I've enjoyed doing. Is there one I've personally quite enjoyed, and I, I assume you have as well, the the debate with Lord Sumption. Um, setting aside your, your differences, the, the debate seems to be something that's done in quite good spirit. Oh, Jonathan is uh, a very old friend of mine. We're very close friends and uh, we, we uh, we discuss the novels of Henry James and we discuss all, all kinds of things, but we, we never actually have a discussion over this one. We only, <laughs> only write about each other in print. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a, a favorite case 
when when you look back at it, one one single standout decision, one single standout case, or, or a judgment that you that you particularly look back on. And well, there, there are different categories. I mean, for example, uh, as I've told you already, I, I, the standout cases for me have been cases of trying to solve intellectual problems. Uh, but the, the only case I can think of which I was to some extent in, emotionally involved in was the one about whether uh, Mr. Blair could lock people up without trial. Uh, and that I felt was so contrary to English ethos and history and all that uh, my adopted country represented that uh, there's not a single reference to any case in my judgment in that case. The only quotation is from Milton. I, I know that judgment very well. It's it's a, a tr it, that's probably my favourite case of all time that I've read. <laughs> that's tremendous. Uh, a and the Secretary of State for the Home Department. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you have a particular advocate? that you remember appearing in front of you as being absolutely exemplary? And I'd be interested to know what you think they did particularly well, or what makes a good advocate. I hesitate to answer that question for fear of leaving out somebody whom I ought to have left in. But um, certainly Jonathan Sumption was a great advocate from, from my point of view, in that I felt that we were trying to do the same thing. We were trying to, 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 to untangle muddles of thinking. Uh, uh, I very much enjoyed the late Gordon Pollock, who was an aggressive advocate, but very funny and very and very clever and very enjoyable. Um, David Panic, I enjoyed as an as an advocate. Again, very concise and very good at explaining things. And then we tend to learn from. Uh, our mistakes and if we are able to learn from others mistakes that that's even better so I'd, I'd be curious if if you can also remember any horrendous faux pas or or balls that were dropped in front of you or perhaps without naming names <laughs> no i can't, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, I, I can't. I, <laughs> actually yeah. i mean in the I, it, it would go back a long way because in in, in the house of lords people don't really uh, make horrendous mistakes. They've, the case has been argued three times. Mm -hmm. They've been at it for some. No, it, it doesn't happen. So I mean, they may be right. They may be wrong, but they're, they're not. Uh, it's not horrendous. So then, moving to more fertile ground, in, in that in that sense, do you have an opinion on solicitors acting as advocates? Because in, in your current role as an arbitrator. I imagine you see that far more commonly. Yes. Oh yes. I've had some. I've had some very good solicitor advocates. Really. I mean, I recently done an arbitration uh, in which uh, um, we had a solicitor advocate from uh, the uh, Tokyo branch of an international firm, and uh, he was really very good indeed. You know, he thought it all out in the end. Hmm. I have heard the uh, I have heard members of the the bar turn to me and say, "Well, just because solicitors can doesn't mean they should." Um, uh, yes, but I imagine no, that is also self preservation. I've not had bad experiences. <laughs> that, that's very pleasing to hear. Yeah. Um, so then, it also occurred to me that you have, over the course of your career considered an enormous range of cases, including many which touch on quite unpleasant sides of humanity. And you mentioned the Belmarsh detainees. And we hear a lot these days about mental health. And so I, I wondered whether these cases, particularly when they run for days and weeks at a time, do they weigh on you at home? And how do you deal with that? No, I've, I've never been worried at home by a case. I've, I've ne you know, I mean, you, you have your say, and and and, and that's it. Um, no, I've, I've I've never taken these problems home in that sense. Hmm. That's good to hear. It's yeah. 
is it a common a common thing that we that we hear? Um, you say that you, that's what you commonly hear. You say com commonly hear that people struggle to separate work from from home and yes. compartmentalize one from the other. No, no. Um, so you retired from the House of Lords in two thousand and nine. Correct. Um, and you now sit as as we mentioned as an arbitrator, but you, yes. you remain as a um, non permanent judge on the Court of Final Appeal. I do, I'm, and I'm, I'm due to return in November, uh, if uh, if things permit. <laughs> Thank you for putting up with the quarantine, um, if that's still in place. Um, but we we recently saw. Lord Reed and Lord Hodge stepped down from the court final. Yes, yes. I wondered if you had well, a, a view. I mean, uh, I, they, I mean this, this, it, they, they stepped down because they felt that uh, they couldn't uh, uh, really participate in a legal system which uh, uh, included the national security law and what uh, appeared likely to be the very more broad powers which it gave the executive. Um, and th th these things, I think, are a matter of uh, individual functions. And uh, because, I mean, I, having, having uh, um, grown up in South Africa, uh, there were there people who resigned from the bench or who didn't accept appointment to the bench for much the same reasons. And there were other people who stayed on the bench, uh, admirable people, who did so because they felt that it, they, they, could, they could help either in not necessarily in connection with uh, those particular laws, but that they could help generally to um, improve the, the, the system of justice in that country. Uh, and uh, th these are individual decisions, and I, 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 I would not question uh, uh, Robert Reed and, and uh, uh, Hodges' view about the matter at all. It's not necessarily the decision I would make. I, I'm personally very, very grateful for that, and I, and I agree that um, the support that the non-permanent judges provide to the Hong Kong courts is is superb and very very valuable. Yes, uh, in, indeed. Well, it's, I must say, I, I, uh, it's been one of the, really the great experiences of my life to have been on the Hong Kong court more or less since the time it was founded in, in uh, at the, after after the handover at the end of ninety seven, um, and I think that that is particularly the case because the. Uh, the three chief justices with whom I've sat, Andrew Lee and Jeffrey Ma, and now Andrew Chung, have been such admirable people, not, not just good lawyers, I mean, they were good lawyers, but really fine people. And uh, I've valued them as, as, as friends and colleagues. Hmm. And then a, another aspect um, to your, your continuation um, sitting in the uh, CFA is, of course, that you are able to continue to contribute to the common law. Well, exactly, yes. That, that's something to be taken into account. Mm. So, so this then is a, a, a personal concern, um, which Lord Thomas also uh, argued very, very forcefully in 2016, which you may recall where he expressed Yes, himself. I do, yes. I remember it well. Yes, yes. We're, 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 we're draining the common law of, the, of its sources of material. Precisely. And you've now joined the arbitration community. Well, what, what, I can, <laughs> what I can say is, I mean, it may be my fault and it may be the kind of cases that I've heard, but I cannot think of a single, and I've now been doing arbitrations for 12, 12 to 13 years, I cannot think of a single award I've written, which I thought it would have enriched the common law to have published. Hmm. Not one. That's interesting. I, I have not heard, heard that argument. Um, because you, you don't, you, that's not your business. You're not there. I mean, I don't regard it as an arbitrator to behave as I did as a, as a judge of the, uh, of the House of Lords and try to sort out intellectual problems. My job is to try and work out what the law is as laid down by judges, even the first instance. I'm not going to go and 
second guess that. So you would not agree then with, with Lord Thomas that appeals should be easier or, or the section 45? No, I don't. I don't see why. Uh, it, it, quite plainly, the clients want as few appeals as possible. They win some, they lose some. And if, if the, you, in the business of international arbitration, you take, you take that as part of the, uh, something that you have to accept. Mm. And they don't want appeals. And I don't see why they should be made sacrificial victims in order to enrich the common law. When, in my view, it wouldn't be greatly enriched. And then I suppose I've heard you speak previously about the um, the admirable decision, I suppose. Um, I forget precisely how you phrased it in, in Roe and Wade um, that was arrived at through perhaps unconvincing, unconvincing reasoning. Um, and similarly, you, you also mentioned uh, previously a, a Privy Council decision where, where similarly intellectually um, difficult uh, reasoning was was used in order to avoid an execution yeah. and it, it is sort of it occurs to me that arbitration is often perceived as being a a more flexible and more commercial form of dispute resolution and in the absence of a of a right to appeal it becomes potentially quite a fertile ground for outcome driven decisions rather than... Yes, I, I agree. There is, there, there is that danger and I can't conceal that there's been the odd arbitration in which I have um, come to the view that, that my colleagues have approached the matter in that way and I've, I've put in one of... Well, that's not, 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 that, this is rare, but it's happened. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've put in one or two dissents on the grounds that they were... That, that, what, what their view of the merits didn't justify what they were doing. And I also, I think that to, to try to decide the case according to what you think of the merits is a very dangerous thing to do because the clients do not necessarily give you all the evidence relevant to the merits. That's not how they prepared the case. They prepared the case according to what they think is necessary in accordance with the law. And there may be a great deal that you could learn about the way the clients have behaved in the past and etc cetera, etc cetera, which they have rightly excluded as irrelevant but which may if you're only interested in the merits may be something which ought to have been taken into account so i, I think it's quite quite wrong to, uh, uh, to to allow yourself to be influenced by what you think of the merits of the case i, I entirely agree um, I don't think that's particularly controversial, or right? yeah. I should hope not. Um, yeah. Have you noticed any differences in your approach or in the approach of um, your peers as arbitrators between when you were sitting as a judge and now sitting as an arbitrator, or is it a, a very similar job? No, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's, it's being, it's be like being back at first instance again. I mean, you've got to distinguish between, it's not at all like being in the House of Lords, and it's not like being in the Court of Appeal, but it is very much like uh, being a judge of first instance, hearing witnesses and so on, forming a view about the facts. Um, and I find that very enjoyable. Hmm. And so how have you found the, the last couple of years? I, I assume that you have, like the rest of us, had to pivot to this sort of virtual environment which yes. has its own challenges for witnesses and so on. Actually, I think it's worked rather well. I mean, I think there are things which don't work over, over Zoom. Uh, and uh, one of them is social chats with friends and so forth. I think they work rather badly. But the, in, in, in the slightly more formal uh, atmosphere of an arbitration in which you're you know, addressed by counsel or you're listening to a witness and so forth, I think it works rather well. I wouldn't be surprised if it continues continues afterwards because it's all rather expensive to come to the IDRC in London. Have, have you done a, 
a, a similar pivot away from hard copy bundles to, to electronic bundles as well? Oh, yes, very much, very much so. I've got very little paper nowadays. Hmm. That's, you know, that's you go also... to o Opus 2 are wonderful. And, and there, there are other providers as well. <laughs> hmm? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not responsible. Those are the ones that that's whom I've been given. <laughs> um, so one of the complaints that I that I commonly hear um, targeted against arbitration is that many arbitrators um, tend to take to heart the flexibility that's inherent in the procedure, which is not so freely given in the courts. Um, do you think that arbitrators... Sorry, can you just, I beg your pardon, let me quite catch that. Can you say it again? Um, so one of, one of the complaints that, that I often hear is that yes. um, arbitrators really take to heart the flexibility within the procedure um, that, that they have that is not present or so freely given in the court. And I wondered whether you... I mean, they're too, they're too flexible. Yes, precisely. Yes. Resulting in delay yes. and increased cost. Yes. Um, I can't say I've noticed a lot of that myself, although I constantly hear about it. And I mean, the, the, the story always is that the arbitrators are terrified of being challenged for not giving each party an ample opportunity to present their case. Um, I, I, I haven't actually, I, I haven't had an, a, a case where I felt that, that that was the explanation for what we were doing. Hmm. Okay, so, so you, you may not agree that that, that that needs to be taken on board by more arbitrators. Well, I it? mean, different arbitrators do different things, but I, that hasn't been my experience. Hmm. I think we've, you know, we've, we've, we've taken the case along, it seemed to me, at a reasonable rate. So then, looking, looking back over the last 60 years or so of, of your career um, moving to sort of the the retrospective portion of the conversation um, I'm sure that you've seen many many changes and one aspect that we haven't touched upon yet is diversity yes. I'm, I'm almost reluctant to to mention it because two two white uh, Jewish men discussing diversity smacks slightly of hypocrisy um, yeah. but uh, as a profession we do have an awfully long way to go and I wondered if you had any comments for how we might improve or, or generally on the topic. I, I, I don't have any comments as to, I mean obviously uh, greater diversity is highly desirable. How you uh, achieve it is uh, not something on which I really have any views at all. What I do know though is that um, the position of, of women uh, at the bar is such as to make it very difficult uh, to produce any um, immediate increase in their representation at the bar as silks or on the bench. And this, this is because the, of the problem of motherhood. That uh, if, you, if you're in a, a firm of solicitors, uh, that's not so bad. You can have maternity leave. Other people will do your work while you're away and you will continue to be paid. But if you're at the bar, if you are not there and you're not doing the work, nobody else is doing it for you. Hmm. And this is why, particularly this, but this is why the, the, the whole question of uh, uh, women at the bar and the in increased representation of the bar is such a difficult one because of the structure of the bar. Perhaps then we ought to look at, at uh, the individual sets and treat them more as the firms of solicitors, but of course that conflicts with the fundamental basis of being self-employed. Well, it does, yes. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't quite know how one gets, gets around it. I mean, whether, I mean, Chambers, for example, uh, they will uh, pull money on paying pupils because they want to attract good pupils. But they won't pool money on providing maternity leave for, for women members. Hmm. Uh, what the answer is, I just don't know. 
As for other forms of diversity, I really have no idea how you improve that. Yes, it seems to be more of a grassroots, grassroots yeah. problem. Mm. Um, do you remember at the very early stages of your career, perhaps um, from your pupil master, um, being given any constructive criticism? Constructive um, criticism? Well, or, 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 or destructive criticism. Or destructive criticism. And, and I'm, sure there was, did. I'm sure there was lots of criticism, but I can't remember anything in particular. Uh, do, you, do you recall any, any particular weaknesses, any sort of self-reflection? We thought, gosh, I must do better at, at this, that or the other. No, I, I, I mean, I can't recall anybody say anybody saying, "Well, um, no, the, the, if you did this, that would improve your cross examination, or uh, you know, arrange your submissions in chronological order, or, or, or something like that." I, I, I don't recall that. I think the, I'm afraid. I have to say, I don't know whether this is going to be very attractive to your listeners and so forth. But I do, do think that the main thing you need to have a successful career in the law is genetic luck. <laughs> are, we, are we verging into a nature versus nurture debate? What's that? Are we verging into nature versus nurture? Yes, nurture versus nature debate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, you need a bit of nurture as well, but I think you definitely need genetic luck. <laughs> so then, I, I've in my notes I've borrowed from your your five principles um, in, in oh, yes. and, and Bromwich. Yes, yes. Um, no, I, uh, I've not assembled any any such. But the, if you <laughs> you must have noticed uh, that if you're writing a judgment and uh, you want it to be cited by other people in subsequent judgments, the way to do it is to have numbered paragraphs. <laughs> All sorts of people do that. Quite correct. So, if we say then that um, that the first point might might be uh, outright talent, can you think of any any others that you would suggest? Well, I mean, coming down to, um, I mean, looking looking at it from the from the law as I've seen it, which is arguing cases, uh, advising on cases, and listening to argument on cases. Uh, looking at it that way, um, at that level, the, the the really important thing is to be able to explain things, to to uh, to work to work out the, the answer to yourself, and to be explained to be able to explain it clearly to the judge if you're arguing before a judge, or to the wider audience if you're writing a judgment. You, you've got to be able to, to put it as simply and clearly as possible. That's... I've heard it described also as, as being a good storyteller, but I suppose that's storyteller. Can... Yes, that, yes, exactly. I mean, it is, you know, it is a bit like, uh, certainly if, uh, as a judge of first instance, it's enormously important. I mean, when you, if you write, you'll get, you, you feel when you're having listened to all the evidence and so forth, you get to write the novel. And it's, uh, uh, you, you've got to write it in an attractive way. Hmm. So then if you could uh, almost play sort of fairy godmother and, and fly back and speak to the young Leonard Hoffman, um, is there one piece of advice that you would give yourself and, and when? <laughs> uh, many people forget when when would you give that piece of advice when would you give that a piece of advice <laughs> uh, I, I was going to say the piece of advice might be don't panic it's all going to be all right but then I I, <laughs> I, I don't remember moments of panic though because I've I've never had um, an objective that I was seeking to attain think you know, it may sound odd, but my view of my life is that things have just happened to me. I, I think that's probably underselling it ever so slightly, um, underselling your, your talents, but... Um... Well, no, I mean, 
whether they were the, the people who made things happen to me, whether they were right or wrong, is another matter. But it, it hasn't been a sort of uh, uh, I haven't had uh, uh, made a particular effort to attain, attain some sort of bill. So I think that that brings me to the end of my my sort of planned line of questions. I have a, a couple of quick fire questions. Yes. And we have had um, a few questions in from the audience. So I, yeah. I propose to do the, the quick fires very, very quickly right um, and then move on to the, the more interesting ones. Um, so the first question is, what's your favourite piece of music or your favourite song? My favourite piece of music? Hmm. Oh, goodness. Um, I think the Valkyrie. Okay. It's rather a large piece of music, it's, but I it claim it all the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Victoria sponge cake or chocolate fudge cake? I love Victoria sponge. And what what is more, I have a, a gluten allergy. So I can only eat Victoria sponges secretly that my wife doesn't know. <laughs> I, I suspect that you may be able to to obtain gluten-free Victoria sponge now. But, you um, can actually, yes, you can. Um, as, as a thank you for this conversation, I'll, I'll see if we can arrange that. Um, okay. Do you have a favourite book? Favourite book? Um, yes. Uh, Henry James, The Ambassadors. And what's your favourite place to go on holiday? Do you have a, a favourite bolt hole? Uh, well, it, 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 for different purposes. I mean, I, I like going to Hermanus in Cape, near Cape Town, the hmm. um, seaside resort there, which I've been to until, the, until COVID. We, we, we went once a year for about 10 years. And I love going to Italy, hmm. almost anywhere in Italy. I feel the same way, um, although I haven't been to South Africa, which is a, a gaping hole in my experience. <laughs> moving on. Um, so we have a, a question in, from the audience. Do you think there is a problem of arbitration expansionism um, that the arbitral tribunal tend to rule that they have jurisdiction regardless um, of third party involvement and arbitrability? coupled then with, in, in some jurisdictions, judicial non-interventionism? I'm not sure I follow altogether that question. Uh, are you saying that arbitrators are t too anxious to assume jurisdiction when they don't have it? I think that is the crux of the question, yes. That's the, that's the question, yes. Well, there you are. Um, we, um, I shan't tell you what it's about, but I, we're just about to publish an award saying, which we heard long argument on the merits and so forth. And we're just about to publish a war saying we don't have jurisdiction. Yeah. Well, I, I clearly will, will not know, but I, I hope that's ICC or um, Russian, the Russian Arbitration Centre, because as far as I'm aware, those are the only two where, where we would ultimately be able to read it. Although, <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's good to hear. Do, do you think there is a problem generally with, with arbitral tribunals taking? I suspect there, yes, I suspect there is. Um, yes. Uh, actually, having just said that we're about to publish an award which says we don't have jurisdiction, we're also about to publish an award in which uh, Hoffman dissenting, we say we do have jurisdiction. So that perhaps that supports the questioner's, mm -hmm. questioner's uh, inquiry. Uh, so then the next question um, is, what are your views on the recent leak? This is coming back to uh, the Roe v Wade point, I think. What, what's your view on the recent leak of the draft judgment of the um, US Supreme Court? And is, is it ever justified to leak a judgment to put pressure on the court? No, it's absolutely outrageous to admit. But the, court, the, the, the trouble is that the uh, American Supreme Court is, is part of politics. It's not, uh, it's not really uh, a court in the way that our court is. And, and I mean, the, it, it would take a long time to try to explain why I think this is the case. But 
in, in, in the UK, uh, we're in the wonderful position that, for example, abortion is a matter of statutory provision. We've got a, a statute about abortion. We've got a statute about sex discrimination. We've got a statute about uh, uh, suicide. We've got uh, uh, no capital punishment. Uh, all this has been decided democratically by statute. None of this, everything is up for grabs in the United States before the court. And the, the result is that uh, as far as the House of Lords or Supreme Court is concerned, nobody knows who we are, which is wonderful. Nobody, 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 nobody. In America, everybody knows exactly who the nine justices are and what their politics are and what they have for breakfast. Uh, and so it, I think they're an altogether different institution from us. And their, their politics is almost more important than their reasoning ability. Yeah. Um, well, Lord Hoffman, that, that brings me to the end. So I think all, all that remains is to say thank you so much. Um, oh. on, on behalf of myself and the uh, HK45 committee and all of our members, it's been a, a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, and to everybody else, our next session um, is on the 2nd of June. Um, I believe we will be speaking with Melita Hodgson of Arnold and Porter, New York. So I look forward to seeing you then. Good. Sure. Bye. Bye-bye.